Hello, everybody. Welcome to this very special episode of Yes Mantri Ji. For this episode, we are joined by uh, a very eminent member of the IS community, uh, former governor of the Reserve Bank of India and former finance secretary, uh, secretary to the government of India, Dr. D. Subarao. Uh, sir, welcome to the uh, Yes Mantri Ji, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Subha has recently written a piece for the Times of India, a piece which has triggered a lot of debate um, a, within the IS community and even outside of it, uh, in which he rather emphatically has declared that the IS has failed the nation. Uh, and while the cliche argument in support of this sentiment is often to blame politicians uh, for the deterioration of the IS, uh, Dr. Subarao has argued that there are more structural issues at play. Uh, so. Before we get into uh, other questions about the IS and its uh, its said failure, uh, so why do you think the IS has actually failed the nation, and what do you think are the factors responsible for this failure? Uh, and I ask that uh, especially because even over the last seven decades or more, uh, the recruitment process, the training process, uh, the promotion process, etc. of the IS has remained the same. So what explains its deterioration or failure over the last few decades? Thank you, Sanya. That's two questions. Yeah. First of all, I think the IAS has failed the nation. Uh, that's a very broad-based question. Of course, you can uh, argue one way or the other. But at a very broad level, I believe the IAS has failed the nation because the nation, the large majority of the people have lost confidence in the IAS as a service. A confidence that it was once enjoyed a formidable reputation that said that has faded away eroded. That's the reason I believe the IAS has lost the nation's confidence. Now, why is that so? It's a very complex set of reasons. You know, like you mentioned, several dimensions: the recruitment, examination, training, and induction, and in service performance evaluation, career management, opportunities for self improvement. These are all big problems, but I don't believe they explain the deterioration in the service. What explains the deterioration in the IAS is the deterioration across board in the society at large, in character, in values, in ethics, in morals, and scruples. Yes. You know, institutions are fade away, governance structures have become politicized. The large majority of the people feel that the system is rigged against them and that the rich and powerful and the privileged are able to get ahead by rigging the system. So this disenchantment with the IA is a consequence, the ineptitude, indifference, uh, inefficiency that's crept into the IA is, is a reflection of this deterioration in the service and the motivation right. and the incentives that once drove the IA are eroded. Right. So you write also that uh, post-independence, the IAS was seen as the delivery arm of the nation. And uh, so do you think that the post-liberalization era called for a parallel overhaul of the Indian civil services as well? Uh, and in order to sort of respond to the changing needs of uh, the country and especially its economic needs. Um, and because you have written previously that the IAS had been designed for the pre-reform era of a dominant state. So do you think that there was, uh, there is a lack of parallel change uh, in the structure of the IAS that is also responsible for its failure uh, over the last few decades? Yes, sir. no. But give, give me a couple of minutes to explain that. And if you go back in the pre-independence colonial era, we had ICs. The Indian Civil Service with very limited function, just two functions, which is maintain law and order, collect taxes. Post-independence, we had the IAS, which in addition to those two functions, had the enormous responsibility of constructing a welfare state and a development state from ground zero. Yeah. Whether it is agriculture development, land reforms, industrial promotion, delivery of education and health, yeah. social justice, rule of law, the IAS was seen as a delivery out. In addition to all that, we had the country, the economy, going into a religious regime of uh, controls, permits, licenses. Yeah. So the IAS became the delivery arm even for administering these controls. What the 1991 and subsequent reforms did 
was for the state to yield to the market. The dominant state yielded to a market-oriented state. Yes. So the IAS mindset had to change. Instead of seeing the private sector as a seeker of patronage, a seeker of licenses and permits, the IAS had to see the private sector as a development partner. And the most high-profile example of this, we see the public-private partnership, but that's just the most high-profile visible. Across vernacular press, regional press in India, we see state governments actually touting, uh, you know, going to town, publicizing how much investment they've been able to get. It. We see pictures of ministers with yeah. private sector uh, 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 investors uh, yeah. showing how much investment they've been able to get. So the IAS had to change its mindset. And this is the final thing I have to say, which is somewhat in response to your question, which is that my generation of civil service, we were inducted and trained in the pre reform era Correct. in a dominant state. So the change of mindset had to come within us. But the present generation of civil servants have been inducted in a pro reform era. So right. I don't think for them the change in mindset is much. But sir, one can also argue that uh, while a change in the mindset is very important, and in fact, we had the Prime Minister uh, last year talk about, uh, in fact, deride this Babu culture that plagues the IAS even now, and he did this on the floor of the parliament. But uh, what I meant to ask is that, do you think structurally there needed to be, a, uh, structurally and formally speaking, there needed to be changes in the IAS system post the 91 liberalization in order to complement the change changes in the economic model of the country? Or do you think it was just about the mindset that never changed? Well, basically the mindset, but structural changes in the sense of, uh, you know, whatever personality traits, attitude training that is required to treat the private sector as a partner in development, that is important, you know. Uh, what a, there is a certain personality and character required to be a good leader a good IAS officer. But in addition, certain attributes are required, certain mindset attitudes are required to treat the private sector as, as a partner in development. Right. So could you give us an example of this uh, phenomenon of, or, or of this mindset that uh, among IAS officers that tends to act as a roadblock vis-a-vis -vis the uh, private sector? Um, just a general example for a lot of IAS officers who may be watching this show. You know, I'm thinking on my feet, but uh, maybe I'm outdated, but 40, 45 years ago, and I was serving the feet, okay? The, we used to think twice before being seen with, uh, you know, the private sector uh, because of the perceptions it will set okay. about IAS officers that they are... Uh, they're all a privileged lot, and yeah. there is some coalition of vested interests, etc. So that image of uh, being aloof from yeah. the private sector was considered a value or an ethic in the service. Right. Which, looking at that from the perspective and the culture of that time, was a very valid perspective. Mm -hmm. But today, uh, you know, IAS officers go along with ministers. To solicit investment from private sector, they go around the country, go around the world. So that's an example, if you want, about what the mindset change that is required. Right. So it's interesting that you talk about uh, the perception of the IAS because one of your former colleagues, Mr. Uh, Deepak Gupta, has in fact responded to your piece uh, by writing a piece in the Times of India itself, uh, where he counters your point of view and says that no, the IAS is not fail the nation. And he says that it is essentially the public perception of the IAS that is negative. And uh, the role of IAS officers in preserving national unity and constitutional rule is widely recognized even now. And this is something that one can argue we saw in the pandemic as well, when, um, when the crisis at hand was so unprecedented, uh, everyone was once again uh, looking at the DM's office for direction and guidance because nobody knew what to do. So, um, so in fact, this is something he says himself, one of the most trusted institutions in India remains that of the DM's office. And he says a large part of the problem with the IS remains the image problem. So would you agree with him? 
Before I answer that question, I want to address one, one comment you made, which is that for all the criticism that I'm making, that the society makes against IAS, there are hundreds yeah. of outstanding officers out there in the field. You know, performing, as I said in my article, near medicals under testing circumstances. Yes. So I want to take advantage of this platform you've given me to acknowledge all that the good work they're doing and all the good reputation they earn for the service. Right. Now, let me come to Deepak Gupta's article, which I've read. Uh, uh, he comes with enormous experience. He was chairman of the UPSC. He's done a lot of research. In He's the written IAS. a book, in fact, on the IAS. He's written a book about uh, 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 reforms in the IAS. So he's a person who has seen and thought about this quite a lot. Yes. I agree with some of what he says. I don't agree with some of what he says. Right. What he says, as I understand, is there's good and bad in the IAS. The good far exceeds the bad. Right. Don't talk about the bad because it accentuates the negative perceptions. The good has been recognized by impartial bodies such as the World Bank or uh, some other institutions like that. Talk about that. Right. I recognize that the IAs that have done a lot of good. They should be talked about it, but instead of our talking about it, the IAs community itself, I think the society must talk about what good it's done, like you've just done yourself, you know, recognized all the good work done by teams. Where I don't agree with Deepak Mishra, is that we must brush the negative out of the carpet. I don't know if he said that in those words, hmm. but uh, the way he said that we should not give encouragement to the negative perceptions is in a way saying that let's not give publicity to that. I don't believe in that. Right. I think as ex-IAS community, as current IAS community, as a larger society, I think the IAS must introspect for where it's gone right and where it's gone wrong. Okay. So in your piece, you will specifically talk about uh, a deeply flawed system of incentives and penalties that makes IAS officers lazy and cynical and even lose their moral compass. Uh, you also say there is a need to turn the IAS into a meritocracy. One, how can that be done? Uh, and two, who will do that considering the politicians are by and large, uh, they benefit of this skewed system of incentives and penalties. And uh, before you answer these questions, what do you mean when you say uh, the IAS should be turned into a meritocracy? What do you mean by uh, the word meritocracy? Okay, yeah. that's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, first of all, uh, you know, what's, what's wrong with the IAS today is that there's almost automatic promotion. Right. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's like we say by a flex of time, if you complete 15 years, you get a certain grade. If you get 25 years, you get another grade, get some promotion. Yeah. It's almost automatic. Virtually everyone gets outstanding grade. There is no distinction between the uh, outsized performers and the mediocre and the uh, and the substandard. Right. No matter how well, you know, let's say I am a mediocre officer. Yes. And there is a, a woman who is outstanding, but she's junior to me. She's performed, delivered results, but she just cannot get ahead of me because I'm senior to her. And unless I'm promoted, she cannot be promoted. Right. So it is this, and in the IAS, nobody gets thrown out unless you probably commit some heinous crime right. to get thrown out. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I meant by saying that there is a flawed system of incentives and penalties. Right. And that needs to be fixed by turning the IAs into a meritocracy. Right. Now, what's coming to your second question, what I mean by a meritocracy, what people mean by a meritocracy is that in a meritocracy, the competent, only the competent, and all the competent rise to the top and the rest go away. Right. So the IAs has to become like that. And for that purpose, there has to be a, an objective evaluation. And those who don't measure up needs to be weeded away. Right. Now, when I say this, a lot of people say that, look, that leads to further victimization of the IAs. The politicians will actually ensure that if we don't comply with them, you're the, you're the one going to, who's going to be weeded out. So the weeding out will actually, instead of leading to a meritocracy, 
lead you away from it. Correct. That's a valid argument. So what I have in mind uh, is left to myself okay. is that this evaluation must be done by an objective body, some institution like the UPSC or someone else, and as blindsided as possible, right. and should be quite independent of uh, your evaluation by politicians, etc. Right. Uh, so that the IAS turns into a meritocracy. Right. Will the politicians allow it? Uh, if you allow me, I'll answer that question because it'll take me no. a couple of minutes. Yeah. That's fine. See, if you look at the politicians today, I have some sympathy for all that they're asked to do, especially politicians at the lower level who face the public every day. Mm. You know, they got to deliver the such at the broad level. Right. Like, for example, the Manrega Employment Guarantee or yeah. educational good schools, good health centers, roads, irrigation, agriculture, subsidies. So at a broad level, they've got to deliver this. In addition, they got to manage retail politics. People who come to them with grievances to speed up the system for them. People who come to them for bending rules, bending the system, etc. Right. So for delivering results at the broad level, they need competent officers. Correct. For delivering retail accountability, not accountability, but managing retail politics, Yes. They need pliable officers. Right. So it's not as if we are, our politicians, you know, don't want a no. good IA. They do. They do. Okay. So collectively, the IAs of the politicians must get together to reform the IAs for the larger good. Right. So one of the most uh, talked about reforms when it comes to the IAS is the lateral entry reform. And while it has not really taken off in the manner one would have expected under this government, uh, because even under the this government, there have been just a few dozen uh, I, uh, lateral entrants who have been recruited into the government. But a lot of people do seem to think that that can be a panacea of sorts when it comes to the IAS. Do you think that the lateral entry uh, reform can address uh, some of the or a lot of the problems uh, with the IAS system and uh, the uh, the skewed incentives and penalties uh, system that you talk about, can the lateral entry uh, reform specifically uh, address that problem? Absolutely, I think so. And first of all, I agree with you entirely, which is that the lateral entry we have is with a trickle. Right. Uh, and a dozen officers come, they, they feel that the system militates against them. Yeah. The system does not accept them. And, uh, you know, they feel that they set up for failure with. I'm stereotyping, of course, but it's not been a happy experience. There have been exceptions, but it's not on the whole been a happy experience at the macro level. What I have in mind is not the sort of entry. What I have in mind is an institutionalized system of regular recruitment into the IAs at the mid-career professional level. Right. Yeah. So you take people in the 38 to 43 years group, put them through a competitive exam as happens at the entry level now, right. and take them into the IAS. Right. The reason that will add value, the most important reason is the following. Most entry level young people who come into the IAS today have not experienced the world. They've seen the real world only through the lens of the IAS. Correct. They've been dispensers of administration that rather than consumers of administration. They've not been on the other side of the aisle. Right. So what this will do of mid-careers, people coming into the service, is bring that real-world exposure to the IAS. So it's a combination of two streams of recruitment uh, at the entry level and at the mid-career level that make the IAS collectively serve the nation better. One thing I want to say, perhaps will come later in your interview, but the USP of the IAS is the field experience. Correct. The district experience that you refer to. The so DM's office, that's the biggest attraction. The DM's office, yes. Mm -hmm. And there are some other jobs as well, equally right. important. But the DM's office is something that is in people's consciousness as the IAS job. Right. Right. Yes. Most parents want their children to get into the IAS because they want them to right. get a DM. 
Yes, it's about so social think, aspiration. It's about it's aspiration. It's an aspiration. Yes, it's uh, it's an embodiment of an aspiration. Correct. Right. So I believe that these East mid-career professionals, mid-career officers who come in, should get some exposure to the field right. by being DMs for three to five years, no matter that they are relatively older at that point in time. Correct. Sir, I'm also very curious to ask you that, you know, I've had conversations with serving IAS officers regarding lateral entry, and a lot of them have not been very enthused about the idea of lateral entry. And uh, because it also, it's let's be honest, it's an idea that evokes a lot of insecurity among uh, serving IAS officers as well. But uh, some of them uh, also make this argument, uh, which I do find, find uh, helpful to think about at least, that if there is lateral entry into the IAS, there should also be a parallel lateral exit. That is, officers uh, serving in the IAS who have not had any experience outside of uh, the government or outside of the IS should also be allowed to go out for say about five years, uh, work in the private sector and then come back to the IS. So I would like to know your views on uh, on this idea of a parallel lateral exit and uh, with this idea of lateral entry. So would you be a votary of that kind of a system as well? where there is Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, just as you want outsiders to come in with real world exposure, you do want people to join the service early on right. to get real world exposure. So if they want to go away for five years, I think it's a good thing. Right. The, the IA system allows you to go away <clears throat> at the moment, but in a very limited sense. Okay. So I think institutionalizing that is a good thing. Right. You know, but uh, I'm, I'm connecting with our earlier conversation as much as I've said that a second stream of recruitment institutionalized recruitment into the IAS is good. I also want to say that getting people at the entry level, at the young level is good because you do want the youthful spirit, yes. the unspoiled enthusiasm, and the, the enterprise that they bring to the service. And it's the combination of the two that I think will make the IAS a more useful instrument for the nation. So in this show, we uh, very often talk a lot, a lot about inter-service uh, politics within the civil services as well. And uh, the IAS has been widely criticized by its, uh, by other, uh, by its counterparts in uh, the civil services for sort of having a hegemony or domination of sorts within the governance structure and uh, basically not allowing other services like the IAS, uh, IPS, IRS, etc. to rise to the top when it comes to uh, p uh, important positions, especially in Delhi and even in fact in state governments. And uh, under this government, we have of course seen attempts to uh, break this hegemony in some way and to have uh, people and officers from other services also rise to senior levels, uh, especially in the central government. Uh, but do you think that assessment is fair? Do you think the IAS has, uh, has kind of dominated uh, the governance structure in a manner that can be construed as unfair? It is happening, of course, uh, in government of India, in Delhi, uh, people from all services compete for the jobs. But there is a perception, perhaps it's to some extent reality also, that the IAS dominates. Yes. I believe there is good, bad and ugly in every service, in the IAS as in other civil services. The complaint of the grievance of other civil services is that, look, we all came to the same competitive examination. Yeah. You got a few more marks than us, uh, you know, because I had a headache that day or whatever. Yeah. That few more marks should not privilege you for life. That should not be a certificate of superiority forever. I have a sympathy for the argument. Yeah. But I would even extend that further, that no, no recruitment examination is perfect. So it is not necessarily the case that people who did not make it are necessarily inferior to the people who made it. And people who made it to the IAS are necessarily superior to the people in the central services or other, other civil services. I accept that argument. But what the IAS brings to the table and what should be its calling card is not that they've got a few more marks in the examination 30, 35 years ago. 
But what they bring to the table, the field experience, the unique field experience that the IAS and only the IAS has. And we talked about the DM's job, but there are many other field level jobs that the IAS officers do. They get breadth, they get reasonable amount of depth, and they have an exposure of government that few other civil services have. So the IAS, I think, should assert its superiority. I won't call it hegemony, mm -hmm. but I, I think the IAS should assert its superiority, the quality that it can bring to better governance through what it brings to the table by way of the experience from the world outside, from the reality of India. One of my final questions, sir, and this is, I think, uh, relevant, especially because elections have just concluded in five states. There has been uh, a growing trend of civil servants, um, not just IS officers, but also IPS officers, uh, IFS officers, and so on, resigning from service and immediately joining politics and joining political parties. So not even having a cooling off period, but uh, immediately sort of taking voluntary retirement from the service and taking the political plunge. Uh, is it one correct to say that this trend has actually increased over the last few years or has it always been the case uh, that we've had officers uh, switch over to politics uh, even since since uh, since independence perhaps uh, one is it correct to say that and two several commentators uh, view this as a very dangerous kind of blurring between the boundary or uh, between politics and the bureaucracy do you sense this? Uh, do you see this as a dangerous trend as well? First, whether the incidence of civil servants joining politics immediately has grown or not, I have not done any study, but from what reports yeah. we see, I believe the incidence is much higher today than before. Right. I believe, like you said, a cooling off period is healthy. It's not healthy for civil servants to immediately join politics. Uh, I don't know if it infringes on the democratic rights, but having a cooling of period is healthy and necessary. But when I say this, people will say, why only the IAS? Why do you simply love the IAS? The judiciary is happening in the judiciary. We've had a former Chief Justice of India becoming a member of the Rajya Sabha. We've seen some judges getting post-retirement jobs even before they have retired. We've seen army generals contesting elections and becoming ministers. So people will say, why single not the IAS? Right. But the IA should set an example. If it wants to be an elite, right. I, which I believe it should, regardless of whatever else happens anywhere else, it should accept this condition that there will be a cooling off period of maybe two years before they contest for an elected office. That would be a healthy trend. But, It'd be good if it comes across both, but right. must come at least in the IAS and civil services. Right. So since you do say that the trend has increased over the last few years, I'm curious to know what do you think explains this, uh, this trend? Uh, what explains the fact that increasingly more and more number of IAS or IPS officers uh, want to have a political life and are no longer sort of satisfied with the life that they signed up for, which was a bureaucrat's life, an IS officer's life? I, it's not a question that I've thought about a lot. In fact, I'm thinking of my feet. But I think it's both push and pull factors. Hmm. Uh, the existing political system, uh, chief minister or some central minister or in the, even the prime minister might have appreciation. Right for the service of an officer, and he believes that he'll be more useful in the political system than in the bureaucratic system. That's a benign explanation. Yes. Then there is the push factor, officers themselves feeling that, you know, I've done enough in the service, I want to con join, the, join politics. What I find a bit ironic, and even if not unsatisfactory, is some civil servants who join politics explaining, justifying it, saying that I want to serve society. That's why I've joined politics. Yeah. I find that quite unsatisfactory and disagreeable. Right. Because you're willy-nilly giving the impression that if you're in the civil service, you're not serving society. Correct. 
Correct. I don't agree with that. In fact, I believe that whether you're in the government or not, whatever you do, you're contributing to society. Right. So uh, to say that you're joining politics because you wanted to contribute more to society, I believe is disenchanting. You're actually exactly right, because I have written about this in the past and uh, most officers who actually do take the political plunge, this is exactly what they say were batten that we want to serve the society better and that's why we're joining politics. Uh, so my last question as we conclude this interview is that uh, some would argue that is it fair to blame the IAS alone for their said failure uh, because some officers say that it is very easy to blame uh, the bureaucracy for being laid back or underperforming but what about the role of politicians uh, in perpetuating uh, and rewarding sycophancy over performance uh, and this is especially crucial given the fact that non-compliance has very real consequences uh, for officers in terms of arbitrary transfers uh, stunting of career growth or even agencies being unleashed on them if they do not toe the government line. And uh, compliance, on the other hand, is heavily rewarded in terms of uh, plum postings or post-retirement jobs or uh, extensions and so on. So uh, do you think it is fair to blame the IAS alone for its failure, even if one agrees that the IAS has indeed failed the nation? We can't completely blame the IAS. That's my broad answer. Right. But, uh, you know, first, I agree with you that there is a heavy price to be paid for uh, not falling in line, not complying with politicians. Right. Um, you know, but in spite of that, that heavy price comes by way of career setback and sometimes even by extreme victimization as we see every day. As we saw even in the case of Mr. Ashok Lavasa, a sitting election commissioner who uh, was punished for not towing the government's line. Yes. So there is victimization, there is a heavy price to be paid for that. But in spite of that, like you mentioned, Mr. Lavasa, there have been many, many outstanding officers. They have been in the retired community and there are today in the serving community of IAS officers who still uh, uphold the principles of integrity, professionalism, and they are the heroes of the IAS. But the law's uh, I wouldn't say large majority, but quite a significant proportion and an increasing proportion are compliant, uh, falling in line. And that happens, you know, it's, it's common in the IAS to blame the political system. Yes, there's some what to blame, as I've said before, but political interference, both at the broad level and at the retail level, is, comes with the territory in a democracy, especially in a vigorous democracy like ours. So you can't wish it away. What the IAS can do collectively is to stand by a collective code of conduct and on a code of the service, values, ethics, you know, so that that itself acts as a barrier for the politician to try and manipulate the civil service. You know, if the IAS has an image that he's in the IAS or she's in the IAS, you cannot ask her to do this. If that image comes along, that will go away. But why is, why is this deterioration taking place? Deterioration is taking place because a few people fall astray, succumb to political pressure. I want to be honest, but I calculate that. Look, if I'm honest and I'm upright, she's there, she's going to comply and she's going to get ahead of me. So I'm not going to let that happen. I'm going to fall in line myself. And what, what starts as a trickle becomes a flood, which indeed it has. Right. So if the IAS stands by an honor code, by a collective set of values and ethics, and creates an image, that and earns a reputation that he or she is in the IAS and therefore they cannot be politically manipulated. I believe we can minimize, in fact, eliminate this. Right. But sir, do you not think that uh, this argument can be called a little simplistic or perhaps uh, 
a little more idealistic because one can argue that an officer or an individual's interest will always matter more to them than the interests of this imagined community of IAS officers and um, their honor code uh, that you mentioned. I wouldn't say it's simplistic because the IAS did enjoy that sort of a reputation before, so it is within the realm of possibility. Right. It's not something that's uh, not there. In fact, uh, you know, the, 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 what you just described is what people in operations research say is the prisoner's dilemma. That collectively you stand the gate, divided you fall. Correct. So if the IAS officers start betraying each other, they fall, all of them. But if they cooperate, they'll get ahead. As a service and as individuals in the service. So, yes, it might sound idealistic, but change has to start somewhere. Right. And across history, progress has come because some elites have triggered the change. Right. And I hope that the IAS can be that elite, the change agent that triggers the change in society at large. Right. Dr. Subarao, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining us at Yes Mantriji. And I'm uh, very sure that a lot of IAS officers and IAS aspirants, aspirants who must be watching this show would benefit hugely from uh, your views and from your insights on the IAS. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much.